uh, didn't get to meet me last time. It's so good to see you. Um, I, yes, have, have a connection to Cold Springs here. Not only do my parents and my sister go here, but, um, but I also got my first title, my first start in ministry as an intern here at Cold Springs years ago, and, uh, and also got to be part of a young marrieds group when both my wife and I first got married that was just hopping at the time. It was incredible, and it was a really, really cool group, and I see some people that I know from that group right now. So it's really awesome to get to be here. It's such a privilege. Cold Springs holds a special place in my heart. So it's just an honor. So thank you very much for having me back. Um, If you didn't get to hear very much about me, yes, I did grow up in this area, obviously having a connection here. I, I actually grew up just outside of Placerville in the Pollock Pines area, which my parents are still there now. And it's right above the snow line. I was really hoping to see some snow as I drove up the hill today because I'm in Folsom now, but uh, I love it when it snows. It's, it's incredible. It's just, it's the most peaceful and beautiful, serene thing ever. And so I'm a little bit jealous that some of you guys got to experience that, or maybe you're here because you didn't experience it, so you were able to make it. I don't know. I'm not sure, but uh, I was hoping I'd get to see a little bit, because it, it really is incredible. This is a beautiful and wonderful place to grow up. And so I felt very fortunate growing up, but I also, in talking to my mom, I told her I was going to share a little bit more about growing up and some of the things that, uh, that I felt like were good and some of the things I wrestled with. And I wanted to make sure I was honoring to her and in, in her place of worship and to her church family. And so I'm like, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm going to share that, that I, I, I thought that I grew up poor. And she's like, what? Uh, you didn't grow up poor. I'm sorry, but that didn't happen. And I'm going, no, I'm pretty sure I did. Like I, I, that's what I experienced. I lived in that house. I, I'm, I thought that I was poor when I grew up and, and I'm pretty sure it was, I have a list. I have a reason. I have reasons why. And she's like, you did not grow up poor. We were just smart. That's why we told you we weren't going to spend money because there was you and four other kids. Like, that's why we said we couldn't spend any money on you. There's just too many of you. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, smart or poor. I'm not sure which one. And I said, didn't I, didn't I live in a tent when we were in between houses, when, when we first moved to Pollock Pines, wasn't I living in a tent? And she's like, that doesn't count. You chose to do that. I'm like, okay, all right. Well, well so here's to settle my, the argument my mom and I have between each other about whether or not we grew, we grew up poor or not. I would, I'm wondering if you guys could just help. Like, see if you can help along. If I gave you my list, what do you think? And I know she's not here right now to defend herself, so maybe she, maybe she will a little bit later, but... Um, if I gave you a little bit of this list, just tell me how, at least at the very least, you can give me some credit on why I might think that I grew up poor. Uh, because one of the things that we did is every time, so I was fortunate enough to live in a household where my parents believed in God. I got to be raised in faith and, and with church as a priority, and we would go every single Sunday. And almost every time that we went, and because Placerville is such an amazing place to grow up, we never locked our car. And so when we'd leave our car unlocked, people would give us things every time we went to church. We would have donated items left in the back of our car for us as we went home. It would be clothes, it would be toys, it would be different things that people were just cleaning out what they didn't need anymore, and they they thought that our family was the one that needed it. And I thought, well, if we aren't poor, then why do we need people to leave things in our car every time we go to church? Although at the same time, I benefited a lot, got a lot of great hand-me-downs because of things that people left in the back of our car, and I didn't have to go shopping. So as a guy, I thought that that was all right. Um, and and so, so that was one thing. We also, at one point in time, the church that we went to, um, we would, they, they were part of a co-op, and so I didn't understand this a little bit more till later, but we would go to the church to do our grocery shopping. And I thought, we must be poor if we can't even go to the grocery store to get our groceries. And my mom just thought, hey, this is an incredible deal. The whole church community is getting in on this co-op. And, and now that I think about it, it was really smart. So I have no idea whether we were poor or not, but I felt like we must have been poor if we can't even go to the grocery store. And then the other one, uh, the other one that was the really big kicker, what I, where I asked my mom, I'm like, okay, all of those other things you might be able to explain. But tell me this, why did you make us wash out Ziploc bags so we can reuse them. I'm like, all that I knew when I was a kid is I want to at least, I don't, maybe I don't need to be super rich, but at least rich enough to where I can buy a new Ziploc bag and not have to wash them out just to reuse them. And she's like, well, 
And she had nothing to say about that. So I might have grown up poor. I don't know. Because we washed out our Ziploc bags in order to reuse them. And I, I just, I always remember I hung on to that all the time. And so whether or not I grew up poor, I did grow up with the understanding that even though it seems like God always gives us enough for today, and God is faithful to provide, it never felt like I had enough for tomorrow. And that was a belief that I grew up with, that there's never enough for tomorrow. There might be enough for today because God's a big God and he's faithful, and, and, but there ne- it never feels like there's enough for tomorrow. And so I thought, okay, if I'm going to deal with this, then I just have to be rich. And so as a kid, I'm like, okay, what is the fastest, quickest way, best way to get rich as a profession? I thought, a lawyer, that's got to be it. I just, I'll become a lawyer. I was not a good enough student. I had no other reason to think I could be a lawyer, but I just thought that would equal money faster than anything else. And so I was convinced that's what I was going to do. But God met me just down the street at a church called Green Valley. While I was volunteering and doing ministry, he met me there and called me into ministry. And I remember when I first sat down with the pastor over there, and he's like, I really think you should pray about this and consider this. And I thought, nope, God and I have a deal. I'm going to be rich. And everything I know about people who work in church, they don't get rich. So um, that's not. I'm happy to volunteer, but I'm going to keep down my rich path here, which was not going so well at the time. But I was still convinced, and so I said, but I'll pray about it, like you do as a good Christian when you just want to say no. And so I left, but I actually did pray about it, and God made it very eerily clear, so much so where I'm like, it's, it was him. He, want, he wanted me to get into ministry. And I'm like, God, but, but like... I'm not going to be rich. Like, I got to give that up. And that means I I have to trust you more with that. And he said, yeah, do you trust me? Like, do you trust me enough to do what I'm asking you to do? And I'm like, this is going to be tough, God, but I think you're saying this, so I will try to be faithful. Please take care of me, though. And then he had me work 10 years in youth ministry, which I don't know if you know very much about that. But uh, I wasn't sure of very many people I knew that could live off of a youth ministry salary. And he had me there for 10 years, and it was an incredible 10 years where God continued to show up day after day. And yet I still struggled with this idea that it's provided for me in incredible ways. And it feels like I have more than enough for today, but never enough for tomorrow. I don't know if you can relate to that. I feel like a lot of us can. I feel like we do whatever we can to control our situation and control our tomorrow to where if God, just, if God doesn't show up, we're going to be okay. And especially when it comes to money, when it comes to our finances, it seems like we're just doing everything we can. We just have to work hard. I learned that, that example growing up too. There was a really good one of just work really hard, and if you need more, you need to work harder. That's, that's just the way it goes. And, but then God will, well, God will cover the rest as long as you're doing your part. But every time that I worked hard, I felt like I was earning this, earning something. I deserved something. So even when I was working hard and things weren't showing up, then I felt like God was not doing what I expected of him. And I would be like, God, like I'm doing my part. I said I would be in ministry. I said I would do your thing. I'm honoring you here. Why aren't you showing up in a big way to where I don't have to worry about this? Why, why aren't you doing your part? Like I'm doing mine and I would feel entitled and I feel like I deserve this because I'm working hard. And then I do everything else that I could to control it. And, I'm, and I would be in this constant struggle and this constant tension. And I don't think I'm alone. I think when I look out at this culture and I look out at people, it, it's not much, I'm not much different. I'm, I'm kind of an example. I'm kind of a picture of what it looks like for everyone else where we are doing everything we can to gather all these things, frantically gathering all these things to ourselves that makes us feel a little bit more secure and a little bit happier and a little bit safer and we feel a little bit better about tomorrow because we're just gathering all this stuff and holding on to it. And yet we're just totally anxious and freaking out about tomorrow. Because tomorrow doesn't feel good. Tomorrow's scary. 
And we ask God, is this how we're supposed to live? Is this what you have for us? Is this how you want us to be? And fortunately, we have the word that tells us what God wants for us. And we're going to be taking a look at that today. Today we're looking at Luke chapter 20. We're starting in verse 41. If you guys want to read with me, I'm going to read it, and then we'll jump back in and take a look at it verse by verse. But this is what it says in Luke chapter 20, verse 41. But he said to them, How can they say that Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting in their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you have given us your word, that we have a story of when your son came down among us and walked among us and gave us the greatest example of the life that you want for us. God, I struggle. I wrestle with it. God, open up all of our hearts today to see what it is that you have for us that can lead us more into this life that you want, that you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so before I jump in to, uh, to that first verse 41, let me give you just a little bit of a backstory on what's happening up until this point, because we're taking a break from the Roman series, and so let me, let me um, tell you what happens a little bit in Luke. So just a little bit before this is the triumphal entry. Is where Jesus gets to ride in on a donkey, which is really interesting that he chooses that. But at the same time, he's riding in victorious into Jerusalem, their biggest city at the time. And he's celebrated. And here's the thing. There's all of these religious leaders around him who are hearing about all these miracles that he's doing, all the teaching that he's doing. And they're going, we're in trouble here. Like People are following this guy and they're either going to cause a riot or, and we're going to be in trouble with the Romans who were, who were over their kingdom at the time or ruling over them. And like, we're going to be in trouble with them or we're going to be in trouble with the people. But there's something wrong here. All the church leaders and religious leaders were looking for a way to go after Jesus because they could tell the people were following him. He's causing some issues. And so... And so as he rides in triumphantly, the first thing he does is he goes to the temple, to their church, and he turns over all the tables and said, this is not what it's supposed to look like. So not only does he ride in with a lot of authority, but then he turns over tables right in front of the people he's making upset, and that kicks the hornet's nest. So now they are really upset. And so he's then, after clearing out the table, t- temple, he continues to show up and teach in the temple every day. In their space. And, and they're going, okay, we've got to get rid of this guy. We've got to do something. So they're constantly throwing things at him to try to trap him in a way that they can get rid of him. And so they're sending their smartest, they're sending their best, and they're saying, go ask these questions that no one should be able to answer right, especially not him if we know anything about him. And yet he continues to astound them by his answers. And they can't find any good reason to get rid of him That won't cause a big problem. They're trying to turn people away from him by their questions, and he continues to answer them with authority. And so they're constantly sending these people to him. And so at this point, Jesus goes, okay, you've asked me enough questions. Now it's time for me to ask you one. And what he's really getting to is the same thing that they're asking him. The whole time they're going, who do you think you are? And he's like, that's what I wanted to ask you. Who do you think I am? And so he starts there. 
And he says, and he says this, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said at my Lord, or the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand and I'll make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he the son? So here's what's going on here. David is specifically talking about Pastor David at Colt. Just kidding. No. Uh, David, in this, in this context, everybody would have known this David. This is talking about King David, the biggest hero to that people at that time. I mean, I'm t- he was a big deal. Like People had bed sheets with this guy and posters on their wall. Every kid tried to be him and as they were playing. They all wanted to be King David. The greatest time of their kingdom was when David was king, and they celebrate that, and they get excited about that. They all knew. They didn't have to even say King David. They just say the name David, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, he's a big deal. He's our superhero. And he says, but yet, so everybody here knows, because they're in the temple, so they understand. Everybody here knows that the Bible says that the, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior will come from David, which means he'll be a son of David. So then, if you know anything about hierarchy of, of like sonship, the father is greater than the son. That's just how it works. The father came first. And so there, he's saying, hold on a second here, though. If he's a son of David... David calls him his Lord, which is acknowledging him as greater than he is. And so he's asking this question is, who do you say I am? Because is the Christ, is the Savior, is the Messiah greater than your greatest king? Is he more important? Is he better than anything? Because if he is, you should be acting like he deserves everything. If he is the greatest, then then you should act like he deserves everything. It should be pretty easy to figure this out. And then he points to this example where you have these religious leaders who act like they deserve everything, and they deserve all the recognition, and they deserve all the credit because they're standing in between people when it comes to God and their relationship with him. And he points out this example next. He says, in hearing all... And in the hearing of all the people, he said to the disciples, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the feast, at feasts. So he points out these people, these scribes, these religious leaders, these people who are teaching and working in the temple. And he says, Look at what's going on with them. Can you not see that this is a problem? When I read this, this is, this is what I got. I worked with students for 10 years, so I'm, I'm entrenched in student culture quite a bit. And when I read this, I go, that's Bible time social media. Like, that's exactly what's going on here. This is their Instagram page. This is their Snapchat. This is their Facebook that's going on right here. We thought it was a problem today. We thought that there's an issue with this culture with social media and how, how it consumed we are by it and how driven we are by it and, and how we get caught up in it. But it was already happening back in Jesus' day. Right there in the temple, you've got some Bible time social media he's pointing out. And let me explain why I'm saying that, because you guys are not, I could tell, you're not tracking with me at all. You can't picture social media back then. Um, let me explain just a little bit. So here's these guys who like to put on their fancy long robes. They're wearing the best thing that they have. What do we do with social media? We put out our best self. We put the best filters. We make sure that we're presenting this hashtag blessed life for everybody to see. Look at it. Look at what we have. We've got these long robes. We're showing off our best. That's exactly what they're doing. It's like taking selfies, but for them, they didn't have cameras. They just had to show up and be like, selfie, here I am. Everybody, and they would go and walk through the marketplaces. Now, back in that time, it was custom, almost law, for people to have to acknowledge their status because they were an important person. So people had to acknowledge them while they walked around. That's exactly like posting this picture and getting a bunch of likes for it. They were getting likes after like after like after like as they're walking around in the marketplaces. They went there specifically to get likes. We always think this is a problem today. This is a new problem that somehow came popped up. This is an issue back then. It's a human issue. And Jesus is calling, out, calling it out and saying there's something wrong here. You know, I just, I just want to, just real quick, just say, one of the things that I think I struggle with when it comes to this, one of the things I feel like 
isn't the, maybe not the, the bad part of this. I just want to point out, sometimes we, we like to show what we have because we worked hard for it. Because we feel like we earned it. You know, some of these religious leaders were picked because they were the best students, because they, they committed themselves more, because they followed more of the rules. That, that was what, it was what they did to earn that position. And they're going, I, I earned this title. I earned these things. I deserve to at least enjoy it, right? Let alone just live the life that God has given me that I have earned. I deserve this. I said before, a lot of times I get caught in that trap. I go, I'm working hard here. I deserve something. I earned this. Because sometimes those who look the most blessed often are not. Those who seem like they have it all often do not. And when I think about my life, that's a lot of times where I run into. Because you see the success that we have, the success that they have, the riches that they have, the wealth to where they can go to the market every day, where they can have the best clothes, where they can have those seats of honor, all of that success comes at a cost. Everything that we have costs someone else. Everything I have costs someone else. All that success has a cost. And Jesus points that out next when he says, they devour widows' houses. You know, that one, when I was studying for this, I circled it. It really jumped out at me. I'm going, wait, there's something there. I know there's an example of a widow next, so there's got to be a point. And so I've studied. I'm like, what is going on where they devour widows' houses? So there was this thing that was set up in their time in the temple where when widows, when their husband would die and they, they didn't have what it took to be able to manage the household well um, and they needed some help, they could go to the temple and the temple would say, we'll take over the management of your house and all of your stuff and we'll take care of you. Unfortunately, they didn't do the taking care of part. They just took. And then they were getting wealthy because then they would go and sell all of this stuff and just put the money in the temple treasury. And they would get money off of this. So they would take this thing that was supposed to be meant to care for those around them who needed help, and they would just exploit it to their gain. This was a big problem that he calls out here. And people knew it. He saying things that people understood in that time. And he finishes it with, they're going to have greater condemnation. You know, as I read through a lot more of Luke, there's so many times in there that it looks, you look at this, the rich person, the rich person, and God says, there's something wrong there. There's something wrong. There's a rich man who tries to come to him just a couple chapters before and says, what must I do for eternal life? And he says, get rid of all you have that's getting in the way. And the guy walks away sad. And his disciples go, it must be impossible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And he says, yeah. That's Jesus' answer. Yep, it's impossible. But then he gives this shred of hope. But with God, all things are possible. You know, I get a little bit scared when I read that because I know I live in America. And I don't know if you know this, but just the fact that you live here means you're rich. Like, I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're anything like me. I live in Folsom now, so it's kind of hard not to say that I'm doing okay. It doesn't feel like I'm rich most of the time, but I live in America, I'm rich. I'm the rich, rich person that this Bible warns about. And I get nervous and go, is there any hope for me? Because there's some things tied to that wealth that I know God looks at it and says, be careful here. You know, one of the biggest issues with being rich is a lack of humility. God favors the humble. And that's where we get to this next example. In chapter 21, it says, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting in their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. You know, 
the rich that it's talking about is those religious leaders. That's how he can say, look at their robes, look at, you know, look at what they're doing, because they're walking up as rich people. And like I said, they got there for a reason, because they could follow the rules and they could do things right. They got their position. I'm sure that they were given exactly what they were supposed to give, the exact to the number, what they were supposed to put in to the offering. And it continues on, it says they're giving out of their abundance, though. There's no sacrifice there. It's just, it's just ritual. It's just habit. It's just obligation. They're giving exactly what they should give. And, it's, and those are the religious leaders. They are the rich. And he gives the contrasting example and says, but there's this widow. And she puts in more than all of them. She puts in all she has. She puts in two small coins. Two pennies. And he calls that out. He says that's an example to live by. You know, I kind of wish that Jesus would have given us a little bit more. Because when I look at the widow's example, I can't help but think she's being a little foolish. And, and let me explain to you just a little bit. Because I know you've probably heard sermons on this before. Um, if you're anything like me and grew up in church, you've probably heard this several times, and I'm not sure I ever heard anybody say that she's foolish, but I'm going, the way I grew up, she's not being very smart, and there's two reasons. There's two reasons. I wish Jesus would have called him out, because I'm not sure he would have disagreed with me too much. The first one is, her giving made the rich richer. All of the opulence of the temple was on full display. These religious leaders are wearing their best robes. They can afford box seats. They can afford trips to the mall every day. They... They had all the money, and where did they get it? From what people were giving to the church. Where did they? It talks in the next chapter about how the temple is adorned with gold and precious stones and all this amazing stuff. Where did they get all of that? From what people were giving to the church, and they're showing. They have so much wealth, they're showing it off. And, and he obviously says they are. They're devouring widows' houses. They aren't even doing something with that. And I go, okay, when I give, God. I want to know it's going to something. I want to know my money's making a difference. I want to know, I want to know that there's that there's something actually happening that I want to feel at least good about. If I'm going to give it away, God, that it's going to be put to good use. And here's this lady who's making the rich rich richer, who's giving to this system that Jesus is saying there's a problem with, and yet he doesn't call out with. I wish you would have given the two coins to the beggar who was out front of the temple. That would have made a bigger difference. But yet she gave it to the temple, which really is just making her poorer and making the rich richer. And, you know, I'm glad that she was so generous, but she could have picked, been a little bit smarter in how she chose, what she chose to give her money to. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. And he also doesn't point out the fact that she's giving herself into a gutter. By any standard, I'm pretty sure that that's like... Why would you do that? She had two coins. She, she could have split that in half. And God still would have called her incredibly generous. She gave 50% of her money. He would have said, look, you, go ahead, keep one so you have at least something. Don't, you gave away all that you have to live on. Like that's, You're giving yourself into the gutter. That's not smart. At least split it with me. It's, it would have been nice if Jesus said that. It would have been good if she would have given me one and then she kept one. You know that. But he doesn't say that. You know, I think it's because Jesus isn't counting her giving. He's not counting the amount. He's not, he's not looking at that. He's, he's looking at her heart. He's not measuring the money. He's measuring her heart. You see, she was acting like he deserves everything. That's a heart that's fully devoted to him. Generosity is an amazing example of if our faith is in the right place. And here is this amazing example of generosity, and Jesus is saying it's not about what she gives. It's not about what can be done with what she gives. It's not about that amount. I'm not measuring that. I'm measuring her heart. I want to be that. I want to be able to say that that is the condition of my faith. That is my heart. I struggle with that every day. 
struggle with it every day. So what does it take for us? This is last time I was here too, that's kind of impressive. It must be the same bird. So what does it take? What does it take for us to have faith like the widow? You know, as I've gone into this church planting journey, I, I, uh, I knew that what God called me to would be the hardest, most difficult thing that I could do in ministry. Kind of like trying to get through a window with this bird. Um, it would be nearly impossible. I knew, I knew that God would give me this, this t that this would be the hardest thing he could ask me to do. My God, if you're make, you've got to make it clear, which he did, and you've got to come through in a big way. And so we've had these times, these ups and downs. I think I mentioned last time, I thought I was emotionally stable before I went into church planting. Um, it's been challenging. It's, we've had some of our highest highs and lowest lows in this journey. And one of these times that was one of our biggest lows was just a few months ago. You know, I don't know if you guys are, if you're married and have experienced this, but typically in our, in our marriage between my wife and I, like there's most of the time when one of us is down, the other one is okay and can kind of carry, kind of help bring the other person up and fill in the gap. We're not typically both at our lowest at the same time. There's been almost no times in our marriage that that has happened, maybe only a couple. But this was one of those times. You know, we had just started out in church planting, we had about six weeks where we were um, just starting to do some of our fundraising and I hadn't gotten a report. And when I got the report, we got almost no donations in six weeks. And I was like, oh no, like, I gotta go home and tell my wife this and it's gonna wreck her. Like we're already feeling the weight of this. We're already feeling like this is a mountain that we can't move. And now, now we, we, don't, we don't have it. Our lowest point, our lowest point in church planting came about money. But we were struggling. And I came in, I knew, I knew she was gonna see it on me. I had to tell her what it was, and so I told her and she just broke down crying. And we both felt incredibly defeated. And we're trying to have dinner, we sent it out on the table for our kids, and and my wife sits down, she can't even can't even stop crying enough to reach for her fork and eat. And, and I'm just, the weight of the world's on my shoulders, my head's in my hands, and we're just sitting there, and our, our two little girls, eight and five years old, just come running up, skipping, all excited and full of life, and sit down at the table, and they see mommy crying there. And they're like, what's wrong with mommy? What's wrong? What's... And I, I can't even bring myself to even speak. Like, well, I don't... And, and even if I could, I don't want to tell my kids that what's really going on. I don't feel like a good parent if I admit it. I mean, if I tell them, it's, we're really struggling about money right now, you know, think God has always provided for us, but it feels like he's not going to at this point. And I, don't, I don't need to scare them with that, for one. That's not good parenting, but let alone have to admit that in front of my kids that I'm weak at that moment. And when I believe God can handle things, I believe he can do it, but I felt so defeated. And so I'm not saying anything, and my wife then gets really angry, because I'm not saying anything, and she's crying, can't say anything. She's like, are you going to deal with our kids? Are you going to do something? I'm like, so I just said, look, we're really discouraged right now. We, we didn't really have any money come in, and it just was impossible to be able to do this church planting thing. And my eight-year-old goes, well, how much do we need? And I'm like, I can't even explain to you. You won't even understand, like, way more than you can even count or imagine. Like, it, you, if I gave you the number, you, it, it wouldn't even matter. And she's like, well, how much? And she kept pushing, and I'm like, it just, it's bigger than you could even imagine. And it feels way too big for us to be able to do. And, and I know God can take care of it, but I'm just really scared right now. I'm really scared. And I felt like she was convinced that that was a good enough answer. And so she runs off and goes upstairs and then comes down a little bit later. And I'm like, i got to pick myself up and be a parent here pretty soon. She goes in the kitchen, grabs a plastic bag, and comes back to me. She writes on it. She hands me this plastic bag. She had gone through her room. She said, Dad, I've got everything. I've found every bit of money that I have. And I want to give it to the church. She gave me 
and seven points. She said, I know it's not much, but it's everything that I have. And I broke down crying at that moment. I'm like, this is the biggest gift anybody will give to our church. And I gave her a hug, and I'm like, man, I don't have what it takes. My wife doesn't have what it takes, but our family does. Because we have an eight-year-old like our daughter who went to art. Her mother and I don't have enough faith. She does. She understands that it costs everything to follow Jesus. And she's like, Dad, I don't. If it takes more, I want I, whatever it takes, I want to see this church happen. And I'm like, that's, that's it? That's, that's what it takes? gets it. You know, it cost everything to follow Jesus. The more I've been a Christian, I realize that more and more. But when you have Jesus, you don't need anything else. You don't think about what it costs because he can be all that you need. I'm still learning that. I'm still struggling with that. My eight-year-old gets it. Hopefully I'll come along. You know, I, when I was reading the story and I was thinking about the widow, I got to this point where I was like, what did the next day look like? It doesn't talk about it. Like, I, I wish that it gave us a little bit of a story about what the next day looked like. Because my, my first thought was she went home and died. She's dead. Like, she gave all she had to live on. What else, what else what does she have left to do? Like, that's, that just happened. She just went home and died. Or, or I wish that maybe... The way that I know God can work, I've heard the stories that he opened up the floodgates of heaven on day two and blessed her like crazy. She got her house back. She got food. She got everything. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't give us that part of the story. Not every story works like that. You know, I don't, I think it doesn't tell us what happens because it's not about money. It's about her faith. It's about being fully devoted to God. Because when we live a life that's fully devoted to Him, He'll take responsibility for everything else. You know, I, my daughter, she only has seven pennies, so you would think, like, that's not a lot to have to give up. You know, it must not be a big deal. But we were talking that night, she goes, if that's not enough, I'll sell everything that I have. I'll give up Christmas and birthdays. Whatever it takes, I'm in this. And she said, Dad, we have God and we don't need anything else. As I was putting her to bed and thanking her for having more faith than her parents do, I said, we have God and we don't need anything else. So I want to ask you guys, what is getting in the way of having your life be fully devoted to God? God takes full responsibility for a life that's fully devoted to him. You feel like things are out of control in any area. What is getting in the way of you being fully devoted to him? You know, one of the things my wife and I did is we started keeping a log of all the ways that God had blessed us, starting with that story, starting with our daughter. And it's been incredible. And as we get through the as we get to the tough times again, we go back to it and remind ourselves how God shows up. It's never exactly the way I would want him to, but it's always beyond anything I could imagine. Whatever you need to do this week, take one step closer to God. As we get through that thing that's getting in the way of you being fully devoted to him, I pray that you go after it. God takes full responsibility for a life that's fully devoted to him. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the faith of an eight-year-old. Thank you for the faith of a poor widow. You get it. You understand that with you, God, we don't need anything else. I pray that you can help us those of us who struggle like me. 
to learn what it's like to give everything for you, God, because if we were to give everything today, I can't imagine what tomorrow would look like. I can't imagine what you'd do with all we have. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.